Today we're going to talk all about SBA financing and why I fell in love with it a few years back as I was learning out how to structure these deals. It's a, it's a very versatile tool. We're going to talk about the SBA 7A along with the SBA 504. We're going to also talk about small 7A and express loans for SBA. And so uh, it, it's a really great program. The SBA doesn't make the loans. They actually guarantee a portion of the loan. So just keep that in mind. Who makes the loans are banks, bank, credit unions, and non-bank SBA lenders. And there's PLP lenders. And PLP lenders are lenders that can underwrite in-house for the 7A. So they don't have to send the file to SBA for underwriting. If they're, they're, if they're a non-preferred lender, they actually have to send the file to SBA. And so anyways, we're going to dive in and talk all things financing, how you can acquire these businesses with little to no money out of pocket by structuring deals in the, in the right way. All right. So I, I kind of covered on, on this already, but who is SBA? Well, the SBA program is a federal program and it was really enacted to help small businesses, you know, get started or to expand. And uh, there's many other countries, like, for example, like we do a lot of business with Canada and the franchise space and Canada would love to have a program. And I think a lot of us here that don't realize what, what a great program it is and that uh, basically a bank typically wouldn't make these higher leverage loans. And since there's a big portion of it that's guaranteed, these banks, you know, participate. And actually, it's pretty lucrative business for these banks as well. So like I said before, SBA does not make the loan itself, but they uh, guarantee a portion of the loan depending on the, the loan amount. So you can do business startup, you can do business acquisition, you can do franchise startup. There's, there's many different uses. You can buy real estate that's going to be owner operated. So as long as you occupy at least 51% of the space and the, and the deal or the business cash flows, then you can do that. If you're a business owner already and maybe you rent space, you can actually do, you can finance a purchase of a building and you can get up to 100% financing. We call that a rent replacement. So there's a lot of different use cases for SBA, and I hope to, to dive in on a lot of that today. So let's go to the next slide. So the, so the SBA 7A loan, the maximum loan amount is $5 million of outstanding debt. You can have multiple SBA loans, but if it's the same NAICS code, and NAICS code is basically how they classify businesses. So let's just use, it's a smoothie franchise. You could only have a maximum of $5 million of SBA financing between, let's say it was five locations. So, But if you were to buy another franchise, which was a different NAICS code, let's say it was a painting company, you can have an additional $5 million of aggregate SBA financing. And, and uh, in the past, that wasn't the case. You were tapped at 5 million, but now you can do that. And then um, there's also a program, which we'll get to later called the SBA 504, which is a great program as well. That's mostly for real estate, not business acquisition. So the 7A loan, the reason I love the 7A loan is because you can use it almost like bridge financing. With real estate, it's got a three-year prepayment penalty. If the term is greater than 15 years, it's going to have a declining three-year prepayment penalty. So that being said, and that's a declining prepayment, it's 5% the first year, 3%, and then 1% the third year. So that's the reason why some people utilize the 7A versus the 504, because the 504 is going to come with a 10-year prepay. Even though the rates are better with the 504, it sometimes makes sense to, to use the 7A. On a standard business acquisition, the guidelines state that as the SBA loan can finance up to 90% of total costs. So if you bought a business for $900,000 and, and you wanted, and then you built in a hundred grand of say working capital and fees and everything ended up being a million dollars, you can borrow up to $900,000. And so, the, so you got to come up with an equity injection of 10%. That, that 10% can be on full standby, meaning you can get a seller carry back and the seller, if, if, the, if it's negotiated that there's no payments for the first two years, that's called being on full standby. So when it's on full standby, that's acceptable as part of equity injection. So typically the banks don't allow for a full 10% seller carry on full standby. They, they usually wanna see at least two and a half percent down. So that being said, if you look at the million dollar business, um, 
two and a half percent of that twenty five thousand dollars gets you in the door right and now there's other factors the business one and that's the cash flow you have to have reasonable experience and decent financials and good credit right and and so there's more to that but essentially you can um, get very creative the way you structure these deals. Let's say the seller didn't want to carry back. You can you can bring an investor partner in that owns less than ninety percent, and if you do that, um, and the investor partner brought the hundred thousand dollars in and they own say fifteen percent, that's perfectly fine too. Now, granted, it's got to all make sense. They also want to typically see post closed liquidity. So post closed liquidity means that after you close, you have X amount in reserves. Now, some banks will say we want to see 10% post-close liquidity. So they'd want to see 100 grand in that case in liquidity in, your, in the borrower's uh, you know, savings account or liquid asset, basically brokerage accounts. SBA 7A loans for business acquisition with no real estate, it's going to be a 10-year term. With real estate, depending on the percentage of real estate versus the, the percentage of the uh, purchase price of the business, it's going to vary. But you can amortize as, as, as long as 25 years with a, a real estate component. There's fixed rate options and there's variable. Most banks are going to be on a variable program, meaning the rate is going to be tied to Wall Street Journal Prime, which is currently at 8.5% plus a margin. And on SBA 7A loans, the regular ones, the, the highest margin is typically 2.75. So today, the highest rate you could have is 11 and a quarter. Now, there are some banks that price these deals much better. They scrutinize the deals more. The SBA creates what we call the SOP, which is the guidelines. But the guidelines um, are, are very, what happens is the banks overlay the guidelines. So some banks are very stringent. And some are very liberal and will underwrite basically off of the SOP that the bank has. So what I do in the equation is I help navigate the deal and I know what banks do what and how to. And some banks will do a deal that doesn't have collateral and we call that an airball deal. Some banks want to want collateral. So with the 7A, there's a lot of moving parts. So let's just talk about a business acquisition with no real estate, a business acquisition with no real estate. Um, and it's a, let's let's just say it's a it's a three million dollar um, acquisition with with um, fees and working capital and everything built in. The total project cost is three million dollars, and you're going to get uh, ninety percent financing it. So anytime the loan amount is greater than five hundred thousand, the SBA guidelines state that you need to uh, that the bank or the lender needs to look for additional collateral. So if the borrower had a house, a primary residence, unless you're in Texas, because they have certain laws, you can't do this. But every other state, if you had a house, they would put a second lien on that property to, to make up for the collateral shortfall. Now, if you're buying a business with real estate and there's no collateral shortfall, it doesn't apply. So keep that in mind when you're buying businesses or getting SBA financing. If you keep the loan under $500,000, they are not going to look for additional collateral. So, um, and, 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 a lot of people might have an equity line of credit on the house. If there's equity in the house, there's, they'll still put a third on uh, if there's a collateral shortfall. So just be aware of that um, going into the deal, you know, uh, because you got to be creative and know that those properties will be collateralized uh, if there's a shortfall. And there's always pretty much a shortfall with any business that doesn't have real estate because they're not going to value the equipment at the same dollar price you are. Um, they're going to use fair market value. Um, um, so they're, they're going to give like a percentage. So like, even if you weren't out, if you, if you're part of your business was you were buying new equipment, um, they would only give you 75% of that value. So you can see there's always going to be a collateral shortfall without real estate pretty much, uh, almost hundred percent of the time. And so, uh, anytime there's a collateral shortfall and the loan amounts over 500,000, they will look for, uh, to put a lien on, on your real estate. Now, if it's a partnership deal that you own the real estate, they, they can't legally do that, so they won't. But if it's, if it's owned in your name or your spouse's name um, and, they're, and you're both going on the loan, they will look to do that. So just know that because many of you out there own real estate. So just be aware of, of that. So, um, so essentially, you, yes, you can buy a business. with And if, if you didn't have collateral, that's perfectly fine. Not all banks would do a 3 or $4 million loan if you're... If you're um, not that solid as a borrower, but it's still possible. We do those loans all, all the time. 
but it's just what are the compensating factors of the deal so you can do a deal you could not own a home and get get a deal done we've done lots of interesting deals we just completed a a laundromat startup where where the gentleman was um just leasing space and he was going to do the uh, the build out the total project cost was around a million two we we're able to find finance 85 percent on a startup which is pretty good so uh generally uh, banks are going to be all over the place on a startup you can get as high as 90 percent uh, loan to cost as well most banks if it's a non-franchise might say hey we're willing to do 70 or 75 percent loan to cost some banks will do 85 or 90. it really depends on the deal so that's why um not all banks are the same a lot of people think well i'm just going to go to my local bank well if you don't deal with like a plp and a and a and a banker that does sba day in and day out you're probably not going to get the best experience so most of the plp sba lenders they have a national footprint they're going to lend nationally so keep that in mind because uh, i see that mistake happen over and over again and and i highly i highly recommend making sure you're dealing with an expert that will get the deal done uh and and they are a plp um and sometimes a plp lender will send it to sba if it's like a very very questionable deal and they want they want to make sure they'll actually send it into sba to get underwritten because there's some kind of risk factors they want sba to sign off on but you know 99 95 percent of the time they're going to do it all in-house if they're a plp lender as i'm going feel free to go into the q a and and, and add questions in um that you might have because i'm just kind of going off this powerpoint here um next we're gonna we're gonna talk about the sba 504 the SBA 504 is two loans. It's a senior loan, which is a conventional loan, um, could be made by a bank, credit union, or non-bank SBA lender. And then the second is a um, is the SBA guaranteed piece. So the the SBA 504 can do larger deals. That's not accurate, actually, guys. It's um, they, you can do deals as you know eighteen or nineteen million dollars. It just it just depends. But I mean, most of the time you're not going to see that big a deal, but you can. Um, so um typically s the 504 deals are like two million dollar deals and greater you can get some smaller ones done once in a while but let's just i'm going to use a million dollars of a total project cost you're buying a self-storage facility um you can get uh so so the structure would be the senior loan would be 50 percent of the total project cost so it would be uh 500 grand and then the second would be 400 000. so the bank typically always in, in certain cir circumstances they don't but most of the time the bank is going to fund the first and the second and then after the deal closes there's something called a debenture the debenture happens that's when the second the sba second gets sold off in the secondary market and then it becomes a fixed rate product and if it's a real estate commercial real estate loan it's gonna be 25 year term it's, that rate is gonna be fixed and that rate uh, it adjusts every month, and currently it's at about six point five five, give or take, on a twenty five year term. Now the senior debt is negotiated at the bank level. A lot of the banks today are at Wall Street Journal Prime Plus One on their five hundred four loans. Some of them will be a little bit different. If you're a very strong borrower, we have other programs where you can get a little bit more competitive rates. But generally, that's where you're going to see the rates. It's got a ten year prepayment penalty. Um, the first varies sometimes you can get a bank to do a five-year prepay and then um, but the the uh the second always has a 10-year prepay so the difference so sometimes i when we look at a 7a we might do it want to do it as a 7a because it only got a three-year prepay and you can also build in more working capital and and things like that and it's also one underwriting process so that's how we evaluate these deals as they come in because every deal ha is different and um the other reason sometimes it's, we go 7a even though it could go 504 is because it's only one underwriting process with the 504 you gotta you gotta you gotta have two underwriting processes the bank and then the cdc which is basically a nonprofit. um there's there's cdc's in every state and the cdc packages up the loan with the bank and they send it to sba so it's a little bit longer process but you can do bigger deals better, better fixed rate um debt lower cost of capital, a little bit more um, uh, fees up front, but you could do large construction projects. Now also the difference is, is on a startup, okay, so you can do up to 90% loan to cost with an, uh, an SBA 504. 
SBA 504 will not fund any of the intangibles. So if you're doing a business acquisition with real estate, it won't fund the, the intangible or the goodwill of the business. It will only fund basically the hard assets. So we can actually do a 504 with the 7A sometimes, but just know that because we also have to talk about that when we're structuring these deals. Um, so anyways, you can do larger deals. Um, and if you do an SBA 504 green, you can actually get up to 16 and a half million in aggregate SBA financing. So let's just say you're buying a uh, commercial building and you retrofitted it with energy efficient items, it would actually be, um, and then you have an engineering company come out and it was, um, they signed off on it for the energy requirements. You, you could classify the loan under an SBA 504 green, and then you can get additional loans. So you could buy another building and another building and use the, you're capped though at a $5.5 million second in each project, but you can up, have up to $16.5 million in self storage, uh, SBA part, but I'm not even counting the, the senior debt. So really you have 30 or $40 million of buying power with the, the combination. So, and, and then also if you do the green, let's just say you had a 7A, that doesn't count in the total aggregate. So as you can see, there's a lot of opportunity with utilizing this SBA financing. I already talked about this, jumped, basically the structure is the 50% of total project cost is senior debt, 40% is uh, the SBA debenture, that, so that's the guaranteed portion. Uh, and that is not correct, the 20 year term. It, it could be a 20 year term if it's not a commercial real estate deal. They can do heavy equipment and things with it, but it's on a, on a commercial deal, it's going to be a 25 year term. The senior debt can be is negotiated at bank level, depending on what it is. That can be amortized up to 30 years. I have a bank that will actually, they do a lot of construction projects and they'll do a 33 year term on the senior debt and they'll do interest only for the first two years. So there's a lot of ways to structure. Um, what I wanted to point out on the uh, 504, if it's a startup, let's just say you're building a, a, from the ground up a self-storage facility and it was a startup, you didn't own any other self-storage, um, you're going to take a 5% haircut. So they would uh, automatically um, only be able to go 85% loan to cost. And let's just say it was deemed a special purpose um, property, like a gas station, you're also going to get a 5% haircut. So if it's special purpose and startup, just know that there's going to be some leverage haircuts you're going to take uh, with this product. And so sometimes that's another reason why I use the 7A because they don't have the same rules. So um, usually what happens is I tell people to go to bookwithbow.com and we walk through the deal, what they're trying to do. And it's just because I know there's a lot of moving parts that I'm talking about right now, probably too fast, but, but I want to just kind of give you a kind of a, a depth of, of, you know, the what's out there. I will also bring up, there's another gu guaranteed program called uh, the USDA, uh, USDA um, uh, B&I program, business and industry. We can do deals up to 25 million with that product. That's for areas that have populations less than 50,000. We use a little mapping code. We take the property address and we put it in. If it's in a rural area, you see a lot of senior facilities, senior um, uh, residential, uh, or excuse me, um, assisted living facilities, um, community facilities, um, you know, marinas, RV parks that are more rural areas. That is another great product. Typically, you were gonna, those are going to be loan amounts from $2 million to $25 million. The community, community facility product can actually do deals up to $100 million. A lot of renewable energy type projects. If they're in these rural markets, it's another great guaranteed program. We have access to uh, the banks and lenders on that, those programs as well. Just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, I don't know what that question is, which.com, but <laughs> um, somebody put something in the Q&A, but I have no idea what they meant. And um, let's go to, uh, you can also get seller financing as well on these projects too, uh, as, as part of the capital stack. So you can be creative. Now, keep in mind when you're doing construction projects, this is a big thing. When you're doing construction projects with either the 7A or the 504, you need to be shovel ready before the meaning like all the plans, all the architectural, all the permits need to be in place before the SBA loan is going to fund. They're not going to let you do a land acquisition and then work on your entitlement. So you got to either do an extended escrow or um, or get some bridge debt and then um, make sure it's eligible 
to uh t so like for example if i was buying a value add uh no i was buying a property and i was going to build self-storage the land was a million dollars if i got short-term debt on that and then i got the project ready i got the plans approved then i could pay that short-term debt off with the sba proceeds but once it was ready shovel ready so always remember shovel ready and also remember when you're doing construction projects you definitely need a um a, a solid general contractor because these banks, you know, they're going to want to see a resume, sometimes a financial statement on the contractor that's doing the work that, uh, for these type of projects. You're dealing with a bank, so just remember that. Pros and cons, we've been kind of hitting on it the, this whole time. I do see a few questions. Uh, so um, USDA on the BNI loan, you can do up to $25 million. Um, and um, but you can also utilize other uh, other financing structures in the capital stack. So in some states, there's something called CPACE. It's a state enabled program. So you can do, um, you know, 25 million of USDA financing. You could do 10 million of CPACE financing. And then there's also new market tax credits. You can also you can put all that together in a in the capital stack. But those type of projects, remember, you got to have experience. You got to be you know, a good business plan and so forth. But it is possible to, with the community facility deals, community facilities, uh, that program can do up to $100 million deals. Does USDA loan consider the business address to be rural, a home office business, which is located in a rural area? So just for the USDA B&I loans, just for this product, you're looking at like a $2 million deal. So I don't know what kind of home-based business, but generally it's, it's like a brick and mortar. Now with USDA, uh, the deal has to be collateralized on a one-to-one -one basis. So th this needs to be fully collateralized. So if it's a real estate deal or if, if you have equity in the business, it has to be a collateralized deal. With a 7A, we call it airball. There can be a lot of airball, right? There, there doesn't necessarily need to be collateral. On the USDA loan, it's got to be collateralized. So anyways, here's a comparison. So in the 7A, you can build in working capital in the proceeds. 504, you're not going to. 7a you're dealing with only one bank 7a you're going to have up to 25 year amortization leasehold improvements or eligible use and proceeds must pledge personal collateral in some instances if the loan amounts greater than 500,000. there are fees involved with these loans and it's going to be based on the loan proceeds right now loans that are a million dollars they're waiving the sba guarantee fee to i believe october but depending on the project size there's an sba guarantee fee um, same thing there's fees on the 504 uh, based on the on the loan size, we have uh, a, a chart we use to figure out what the guarantee fee will be. But other than those fees, typically the only other fees are are really going to be like the bank legal fees. So depending on the total project costs, um, those would be the fees we you'd be looking at at doing. But we're rolling those fees into the loan the loan amount in the total project cost. So you're you're able to finance your fees. All right, structuring deals. Um, we talked about seller carrybacks. So um, if the deal cash flows and you're buying this million dollar deal, you would need a hundred grand so you can get the seller to carry up to seven and a half percent on full standby, no payments for the first two years. It can accrue interest. So you can do it that way. Um, and sometimes the, the cash flow from the business. So these business loans are basically we always, if you're doing a business acquisition, we need three years of tax returns from the from the business. So we're we're underwriting. Where you banks typically do a two or three year look back and they average the the income, and then they see if it debt services the new loan proceeds, right? So the, the SBA guidelines look for a debt service coverage ratio of one point one five. Most banks want a one point three debt coverage ratio or better. Um, you can do some value add if you're doing real estate, um, but that's a little bit more to get into than I want to today. Um, we've talked about the equity injection. Most banks want to see at least 5% equity injection. Some banks will do as little as 2.5% um, coming from the borrower or their investor partner that owns less than 20%. The equity injection could be gift funds as well. So um, you, can, you can get a family member to, uh, to do a gift loan. Uh, or gift loan to, to give a gift. It can't be a loan. Um, you can borrow uh, a, a HELOC, an equity line of credit, as long as you have outside income. 
So one of the other qualifications is that um, they look at is that your global cash flow is good. So if you have a lot of debts and you have no outside income, it'd be a little bit more challenging. So they usually like to see that your income covers your expenses, uh, your outside income covers your outside expenses. Um, it's fairly easy on a business acquisition. You, you're going to get the last three years of the seller's tax returns and year date interims and a balance sheet. And then from you, you need three years of personal and three years of business tax returns if you have any other businesses. And a debt schedule, Form 413, which is a personal financial statement and a resume. That's what I need in the beginning. So I help you structure the deal and I help find the bank uh, to, to go to. I don't, um, the, the nice thing about my service for you guys is that 99% uh, of the time I don't charge you a fee. I get paid a referral fee from the bank or a consultant fee from the bank. Banks like people like me because I bring them qualified deals that fit their pipeline or fit their credit box. So I, um, I'm i also a member of NAGO, which is the National Association of Government Guaranteed Lenders. So I'm always participating and learning because the guidelines have been changing a lot lately. You can Right now, you can do partial buyouts too. So like you find a, a seller and they're they're getting older and they're like, hey, you know, we want to stay in the business, but we don't mind you coming in. You can you can buy eighty five percent of the business. They they keep fifteen percent of the business. They don't have to go on the new loan and be a guarantor of the loan. So if you own more than twenty percent of the business, you need to be a guarantor. So just keep that in mind that you have to be a guarantor. Um, so let's go here. Uh, seller carryback. We talked about that. Okay, this is a good one. One hundred percent financing for business expansion. Let's just say you started a franchise and it's up and running and you're crushing it. It doesn't have to be a franchise or it could be any business, it could be a startup. Um, and you've, you've owned it now and you've filed one year's of tax returns. Typically you want two, but with as little as one, some of our lenders will, let's just say you were buying a second franchise, the same kind of franchise, but another territory, you can finance up to 100% with some of the banks. So that is an amazing thing. So that's for expansions. Partial buyouts we talked about. Um, you're seeing a lot of partial buyouts right now. Um, you can get extremely creative guys on how you structure these deals and how you're looking for them. I don't know if the next slide. Sometimes you can do commercial deals on projection. So a lot of you out there are real estate investors and you own a couple short-term rentals. Now you want to get into boutique motels. You find a perfect 12 key boutique motel. Financials are a little weak when we get them because it's mismanaged, we're gonna come in and do a renovation. We can actually put together projections and use that for underwriting. Um, and so the, there's, there are the possibilities for those projection-based deals when it comes to, to SBA financing. They're, uh, they're easier with real estate, obviously, than just a business deal. Now we're gonna get into um, funding franchises. Um, Depending if if there's no build out and it's a small SBA loan, let's say it's anywhere from a uh, hundred grand to three fifty for a franchise startup, uh, and there's no tenant improvements, it's it you don't uh, you don't need any of that done. Uh, I have a bank that will do up to ninety percent financing for a franchise startup. Um, most banks for the build out and everything, you're going to see them around eighty percent on a franchise startup uh, loan to cost. And that's financing the working capital, the franchise fee, all everything you would need to get the business up and going, employee salary for the first few months. So um, amazing, amazing funding for franchises. Um, now there is a, SBA does have a franchise directory. They discontinued it, but yet we all look at it. And the franchise directory just basically says, uh, has, is a list of thousands of franchises or hundreds at least. And if it's on, it says it's, if it's eligible for SBA financing. Now, that list doesn't mean that the um, franchise is a great franchise. It just means it's eligible for financing. So most of the banks are looking at this. Uh, we're also using something called Fran Data to uh, analyze and make sure this is an eligible franchise. There's a lot of startups that it's a little bit more challenging to get franchise financing for those. But yeah, up to 90% all day long. So. A lot of the franchise models in the home service business, you know, are 150,000 or less. So for 10, 15 thousand dollars out of pocket, people are, you know, going from a W two employee to a business owner by doing this, this working with these franchise models. So, anyways, we we do a lot of workshops. There's actually a workshop 
June 29th called Business Ownership Summit. Uh, and then we dive deep into franchises. Um, and so if any of you are interested in owning franchises, uh, you can go to, the, or we talk a lot about different business acquisition things too in that summit. We have a CPA talking about why everybody should own a business, the tax advantages. Um, even if you're W2, you should, uh, even W2 people should pay, I mean, should W2 people should own a business no matter what, because if you see what you can do with the write-offs from section 179 and bonus depreciation, you can actually, if you own a small business, potentially offset some of the W2 taxes you're paying. So um, you should definitely look at that because I see every day I'm seeing people making a boatload of money on the W2, but they're paying a boatload in taxes. And I'm like, why don't you look at some of these strategies about owning a business and you can be very strategic, but a lot of people don't do that. And I don't know why. So that's why I started doing summits like Business Ownership Summit. You can go to businessownershipsummit.com. So that's franchise financing. Um, you can uh, you can finance, you know, we do multiple franchises. Some, some people buy two or three territories and we'll fund the first two locations uh, year one. So it just depends on what type of franchise, but happy to discuss any of that if you have questions. Actually, somebody does have a question. Let's go here. Um, so if, if you have a, if you have a business, so first of all, um, a franchise with no real estate would not be, uh, eligible for USDA, uh, USDA deals for the BNI program are going to be like 2 million and greater type of loans. Um, but if the business is, uh, let's just say you're buying an RV park. So we take we get the address of the RV park and we put it in the in the in the mapping. It's designated rural. Then it could potentially be, it's eligible for USDA financing at that point. So the business address where it's located. But see, an RV park has collateral. So if you're buying a business, it needs to be collateralized, at least one to one. Meaning, if you're borrowing a million dollars, it's got to be worth at least a million. Um, and then. Um, I think that was, let me see if there was a couple more questions. What kind of real estate is allowed with SBA? Please provide examples. Anything that's considered as a business. So uh, self-storage is a business. Multifamily uh, is considered an investment. Uh, gas stations, uh, grocery stores, bowling alleys, uh, anything that's a business really, except anything that would be, um, anything with religion is not, is not allowed um and no like money lending businesses and no, nothing in the cannabis type of industry but pretty much everything else is 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 could be eligible uh is franchise startup equal franchisee uh yes if you if you're looking to buy a franchise and you buy a franchise then you'd be the franchisee that is correct um uh, where do, where do you see most people find these deals? I would like to buy from somebody that's looking to retire. Great question. Um, uh, you, you can, um, first you got to define your buy box. So I always re recommend um, defining your buy box. I would look at getting or go to uh, Walker Diebel's um, YouTube channel or podcast. He, he wrote the book called Buy Then Build. Like if you're looking for a business acquisition, I would start with his book. I think. You have to have a buy box. Uh, Gregory asks, uh, multifamily, eight units. Uh, you cannot use uh, SBA financing for, for multifamily. Now, there is a USDA loan product for multifamily. Um, I, I can't think of the program name, um, but there's a very few niche lenders that do that. But typically, those are going to be bigger loan amounts. Multifamily deals are typically going to be financed with a, just a community bank or local bank, um, depending on the total project cost of the deal. Uh, or if it's a value add type of deal, you can get bridge financing. Um, can you repeat the, the podcast for the buy box? Yeah, the, um, uh, there's a book. Just there's a book. Just go on Amazon or just type in buy then build Walker Diebel. Just follow that guy. He's got a, a good podcast as well our youtube channel i should say it's also a podcast but his book is is about defining a buy box so if you want to do business acquisition then you want a buy box 
if you're interested in a franchise startup, what I would recommend is we have a process for that to help people go through. Um, because um, typically if you're coming from the corporate world, buying an existing business might not be the best thing for you um, because you're, you're don't have a support structure. So like if you want more of a support structure, franchises have processes and systems and things like that. Plus the reason I like franchises because uh, I like the startup phase is because you're you're not paying a premium. Like when you buy a business, you're going to usually pay a premium based on their earnings, right? You're going to pay a, a two or three times earnings or more, depending if it's got recurring revenue or it's some kind of e-commerce business. So you're paying a multiple of of that, right? So the, they're bigger purchase prices, right? Like, but what we do a lot of is is in the franchise space is we're helping people buy franchises that the pro- total project costs are between 150 to 250, somewhere around 200 is probably the average. Um, but there's there's franchises you can get in for all in with working capital and everything for 125, 150,000. So you need a very little equity injection. There's a little bit more work up front because you got to get the business going, but you're not paying a multiple. You're building a sellable asset down the road too so but everybody's different and so I, what i would recommend is people explore and find out what works for you um you know i think a combination of there's people that start their own business and then they say hey i don't want to reinvent the wheel i'm going to find a good franchise concept and invest into that franchise concept there's there's different franchise concepts that are more semi absentee um where you don't have to be working in the business as much. There's an owner operator model where you're actually the one painting the houses, running the business type of thing. There's a semi absentee where you're working on the business, not in the business. That's the book, the E myth. Um, so there's something for everybody. There's, there's business models where it's just you. There's business models where you got to hire a lot of employees. Um, there's all sorts of options out there. I encourage everybody to go through the process and just see if there's, um, something that that resonates with them and that would be a good business model for them hold on let's go back into questions i'm almost done anyways uh okay i think i got all the questions for now if you got any last questions we can get everybody out of here early excuse me um but basically sba financing most banks all right, let me add some some points here. Most banks want you to be in a two and a half hour radius, especially if it's like an operating business or a franchise startup. Um, so just know that like it, like I'm if you want to go if you want to go buy a business, uh, you live in California, you're trying to buy a business in Texas. The majority of banks say no. We want you to be in a two and a half hour uh, two and a half hour radius. Now, if you had a plan to move there and that this and that, you can get sign off. Eighty percent of the banks want you to be in the vicinity of where the business is now if it's a self-storage something like that versus like an operating business but just know that going in that you're going to be looking for go go ahead gregory you want to let me see if i can unmute you uh yes sir you, you you answered it earlier sir so thank you cool all right so you don't have any other questions this time i'm good to go sir thank you all right Thank you. Thanks for calling me, sir. I feel formal. All right. Have a good one. <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, I think that's a wrap. So good. I think we've hit everything. So anyways, this was a lot to take in. SBA financing is an amazing tool. You should learn it. You should call me if you want to look at deals. But the thing, what I will say is if you're buying an existing business, the most important thing to do is know that SBA is going to want the tax returns from that business you're buying. You're going to want the tax returns, not the P&Ls, they want the tax returns and P&Ls. So the important thing is once you're working with the seller or the business broker, it's like usually you're going to sign an NDA. We underwrite off the tax returns, not the P&Ls. The P&Ls might paint a beautiful picture and you get the tax returns. But there's certain things we can add back in. And so there's a lot of things behind the curtains. But but always know, like if you want a quick, quick deep dive on the business, you got to get the tax returns. And then from you, you should you should have a few things ready, a financial statement, Form 413, a resume about you and your professional history and work experience, um, and, and then your financials, your tax returns for the past three years. If you own businesses, 
uh, you want uh, business tax returns for them and, and uh, balance sheets on those businesses and a debt schedule. Uh, other than that, see, that's all what we need to kind of evaluate a business acquisition. Franchise startups a little bit different. Um, a franchise startup, we're going to need the FTD, which is a franchise disclosure document. We're going to need a, depending on which lender, each lender has a little bit different appetite. So usually when it's a franchise startup, I uh, assess the deal and I figure out which bank is going to be the easiest. Like I know if it's a small deal and there's no tenant improvements, meaning we're not building out anything construction wise, I'm going to take it to a certain bank because they're going to, they're going to get the job done the most efficiently that I've seen. If it's a, another type of deal, I'm going to take it to another different bank. Um, and then sometimes you get an off the wall deal where, where the guy lives in, the guy lives in Florida and he wants to buy franchises in um, Las Vegas. And so he doesn't live close. Uh, the SOP for SBA allows for it, but most banks don't. So I have to navigate and get the right bank for that particular job. And so if there's compensating, when I talk about compensating factors, you have to have compensating factors when there's a lot of, when it's not a cookie cut cutter deal, you know, great experience working remote, um, owns another business that he runs remote good net worth, good assets, all that good stuff will make a deal get approved when others would not approve it. So there's a lot of ways to navigate SBA, but it's a great tool to get ahead in this world because nowhere else are you going to get somebody to lend you 90% on just, you know, working capital and no real collateral. Can you go, can you get, go over the seller standby again? Specifically, you mentioned a hypothetical scenario. I'm going to use a million dollars. So you're buying a business and they want 900 grand well you need some working capital and there's gonna be some fees and stuff so your total project cost is a million dollars you're buying an existing business the financials support a loan amount of of up to 90 percent so with sba you can borrow 90 percent of the costs if the cash flow supports it and it does so you got to come in with 10 percent equity injection that's your down payment and so uh, well, I don't really have that because I need some liquidity for after I close. So I need some reserves. So you go to the seller and you say, seller, uh, will you carry back 5%? So will you put 5% on full standby? Full standby means sell, you're not making payments to the seller on that $50,000, 5% standby and uh, for two years, but it's gonna, it can accrue interest. So in business acquisitions and so forth, it's much more common to have seller financing. So that's full standby. So you can usually get up to 7.5% on full standby. Most banks like to see 5% equity injection. I, I have one right now where I've got a bank and, and the, we're, we're negotiating and they're okay with the borrower only coming in with 2.5% of the total project cost. So that would be on a million dollar total project cost, that's 25 grand, right? So that's like an amazing thing. You can literally go and find a business that's cash flowing and for 25,000 out of pocket. Now, remember you on those bigger acquisitions, you have to have a decent financial statement. Like they want to know that they're going to look at your credit report. They're going to do certain things. It has to make sense, right? Like they just can't make a $3 million loan to somebody just because the cash flows there. They have to make sure that borrower can show that they have the ability to repay essentially, you know, deals get done all day long. So I would suggest everybody attend business ownership summit on june 29th uh, if you have any questions you can go to bookwithbo.com that goes to my calendar i'm always happy to meet with anybody help you guys you know structure deals or figure out what you want to do with yourself in your next career i would i would look into all these things i mean what i what i, I see a lot of trends because i talk to like people every day that are looking at real like real estate background investor background um and so what where are the trends right now there's uh, you know, there's a bunch of people that make decent money on their W-2, but they're kind of burnt out and they realize they're not getting where they need to go. Even though their money's good, they're paying 30 or 40% taxes. Owning a business is going to help them get there. And so that some of them are going to stay at their W-2 job for a few years or maybe ever. And they're going to own a franchise business because of systems processes, or they're going to do a business acquisition, or they're going to buy self-storage. And you're going to tap into SBA and you're going to be able to. So earlier last year a friend of a friend was buying a uh, business uh and he had just bought some he had bought a short-term rental he didn't have the cash so i actually structured a deal for him where he he basically closed on the deal he's the majority owner 
but he brought in investor partners that all owned less than 20% and he uh, bought a $2 million business. And now he's developing some RV pads on the property. It came with real estate too. So um, it is quite amazing. Now he was, he's a, he's a doctor and he's got great W2 income and he's a good borrower. So, you know, there, there's other compensating factors, but the point is he came in with no money out of pocket. So you can do these deals all day long, but if you don't have the outside income, that's good. Um, well, if you didn't, I should, let me take that back. As long as the business, if you're doing a business acquisition, as long as the cash flow from the business supports the salary, you can use that salary that you're going to get to show that you can cover all your outside expenses. So you can be very creative, but you just, you have to be solid in other areas. I hope that answers some questions. But anyways, go to businessownershipsummit.com. Go to bookwithbo.com. Go to uh, investorfinancing.tv. Investorfinancing.tv takes you to my YouTube channel. Subscribe there. I talk all financing, business acquisition, franchise, all that stuff and more. I do workshops two or three times a uh, month, maybe. Um, and then I do a big workshop like Business Ownership Summit every half year or so, maybe every quarter. Uh, anyways, you can go to boexing.com forward slash events and you can find out all the events that we're doing as well. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope you learned a little bit. Thanks a lot for attending. Look forward to working with anybody and feel free to reach out. I hope to help, help you in the future in some way. See you soon. Bye-bye. Meet Bo Eckstein, the driving force behind Business Ownership Coach, unlocking the path to business ownership. Visit www.businessownershipcoach.com. Thrive with Business Ownership Coach. Hey guys, Bo Eckstein here. If you enjoyed what you saw, please subscribe to this channel. We talk all things financing. I've been in the lending industry for over 20 years, and I'm happy to answer your questions and provide great content.